So uh, we open the floor now for um, the Q and A, and just a bit of uh, rules, please. Please uh, identify yourself, and then please keep your question or your comment as uh, brief as possible, perhaps 30 seconds. The Asian Center, by the way, this building is called the GT Toyota uh, Hall of Wisdom. It's quite high tech. If you go beyond 30 seconds, a trap door will open underneath you and you will be joining the rats. <laughs> That's why they really, they really hesitate to make me the moderator because I'm quite extreme. So please, um, any questions from, uh, from our audience? <laughs> Drew, there's one story actually which I forgot to tell you. Uh, not only about the hook, uh, my hook comrades who introduced me to Starmin in Perdido uh, Laguna. And I only tasted it once and never tried it again. But uh, your story about uh, the debate between Durano and uh, Alonto reminded me of a story told me by my uncle, Cesar Climaco. When he, was, uh, when he was mayor of Zamboanga City, and the president was Carlos P. Garcia. And he told me about how rats and rats poison were used as a form of political patronage. Now, my uncle was with the Liberal Party, and Carlos Garcia, president, was with the Nationalista Party. And at that time, I think this was the early, oh no, late 50s, uh, Carlos Garcia. As you pointed out, rat infestation was really horrible, and the one, the area that was most affected was Mindanao. And Zamboanga City was really particularly affected by it. And Cesar Klima, Mayor Klimako keeps sending telegrams to President Garcia asking for rat poison, but he wouldn't get any. And then he noticed the areas in Mindanao where the mayor or governor was from the Nationalist Party were getting all the rat poison that they needed, but Sambanga City was not. And so, uh, I don't know how many telegrams he sent to Garcia, urge, each one more urgent than the other, more desperate, asking for rat poison, because, you know, Sambanga was really so heavily at the state infested. So he was now at his wit's end. So what he did now was to send us another telegram, which went this way. Uh, Paro did a, a, a children's nursery rhyme. It says, uh, are you sleeping, are you sleeping, Brother Carlos, Brother Carlos? Our rats are multiplying, our rats are multiplying, because we have no poison, because we have no poison. Ding dong, ding, ding dong, ding. <laughs> and he said that was the only time that uh, <laughs> President Garcia uh, responded and sent all the rat poison that uh, Mayor Klimako needed. So it was used as a form of political uh, patronage during those times. Maybe you can add this in your, uh, yeah, in your paper. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to recite another nursery rhyme? <laughs> 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 that one. No, I just get to, yeah. Well, the reason I, I'm studying this is that, you know, you're senior. Ah, uh, but I write about politics. Write something fun and funny. So, so this is about one chapter, the other uh, project I'm working on is a social history of the mosquito. Okay. Uh, my name is Chito Gascon. I'm with the uh, De La Salle Political Science. Uh, the Liberal Party. Uh, and the Liberal, the Liberal Party. Party. Liberal Party. <laughs> Among other things. Uh, you said you want to write something about fun stuff and avoid politics, but actually I'd like to ask about the politics of, of the Ilaga. Now you talked a little bit at the beginning of your talk about the Ilaga uh, in Mindanao in its relation to the uh, Muslim communities. but. Uh, I wonder if, I know this is off-tangent from the main body of your, your paper, I wonder if uh, you thought through the legacy of that period of the tension between the Moro communities and the Christian settlers represented by Ilaga uh, in the context of uh, the peace process, for example, uh, in the agreement on normalization between the MILF and the government, there's supposed to be a transitional justice and reconciliation commission, and I'm sure issues involving the uh, the tension and the violence between uh, Ilaga and the Moro rebels would, of course, emerge. And what would be some things we could do to address those issues uh, 30, 40 years after the events? 
I can't answer the last one. But um, the one thing I discovered studying the Ilagas in Mindanao is that they're very diverse. The trip did not, they're not only specific to Ilongos. Uh, the Ilagas, there is Visayan Ilagas, uh, uh, but different designs also, Cebu Visayan, Dabao Visayan, they were all Ilagas. And the way they responded to the war was different from the way the Ilongos responded. Um, one, but one thing that we had, well, that was common in all of them, and a lot of the Ilagas I interviewed about this, is that during the war, they were the cannon fodders of the armed forces of the Philippines. Because they believed that bullets will not destroy them, but that's guy. He was, he was a fantastic guy. Uh, he really believed that bullets would not, would, uh, and they were cheap, no? They were cheap, they, he only paid them cigarettes. So the armed forces, the war in Mindanao started with the Ilagas being ahead. And so what I found out was there was resentment towards the Muslims, but there was a strong resentment also towards the military for using them ahead. So what happened here? Um, I think old age will be the only way to resolve this. Uh, if you go through, for example, uh, between Cotabato, uh, General Santos and Cotabato, Every time you cross, before you go into the Ampatuan country, there's a river. Before, the, behind that, before that, it's an Ilaga community. So they seem to be trying, they've come to a quid pro quo now, where they can coexist with one another. Um, but how do you solve this? You have to just take out all the arms. The arms, it's arms, you know, uh, arms that's keeping Mindanao in a serious set, continuous state of tension. Not that people are killing, the more people probably killed in Manila than in Mindanao. No? Uh, but it's just arms, you know. Uh, it's all this very, I mean, you, fly, you, you know, see they've probably done this, taking the boat from some one that's hulo, probably the, the yung lancha, you know, the, the like 90% have guns, you know. Uh, or if you go to Marawi, you have to be back to Iligan City by 1 p.m. mga kidnap ka the way. So that's kind of thing, I think, uh, uh, when Pancho Lara has written a wonderful book about this, the relationship within arms, the illegal economy, and the war economy in Mindanao. And I think it, in order to solve this, you have to first deal with that illicit sector and the guns. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how to do it, I'm not sure. That's, I'm just a scholar. <laughs> I just started it. But I think guns, guns uh, taking out the guns would be the first step. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Amador Peleo from Political Science and International Studies Program in the Um It's very, very fascinating um, lecture, um, mainly because it's the first time I've ever heard a lecture on um, a vermin in politics or political vermin in the Philippines. Um, now, um, people calling other people groups vermin, or people calling themselves vermin, or um, people endearing themselves to vermin. Um, it's, it's not new, it's happened um, throughout human history. Um, let's see, Wind in the Willows is a book about vermin. Um, Beatrix Potter made her fortune over cute and cuddly vermin. Um, or Edgar Allan Poe's Crows. Um, but my, my question really, from, from an international studies program, is, um, well, international relations and national security is about developing perceptions and acting upon them across borders. Um, what do you think the perception of the, well, in, the, in this country, um, once this discourse about people calling each other vermin um, and reacting towards each other in terms of, well, I'm not vermin, that person's vermin, um, what, what effect could that possibly have, do you think? Um, the way people interact with each other and the way other persons from other countries interact with people from this particular country. Thank you. Well, I mean, no, they're not shooting at each other. <laughs> they're not shooting at each other, I mean, now. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's actually each other. Even across borders. Yes. Well, across borders is very fascinating because um, when I was still in Kyoto University, I spent like a, a week in the border of Northern Thailand and Burma, counting chickens being smuggled into a Thailand from Burma at the height of the avian flu. So the formal entrances of the state yeah, where borders are so good, you present your password, blah, blah, blah. Um, you go there, nothing seems to be happening. Everything is in order, no? Inspections, blah, blah, blah. A few kilometers down the river, the river narrows, and you start counting the chickens 
that are being brought in from Iran. Yeah, so I think what's interesting now with the case, if a case of international relations is these things do not operate on borders anymore. They cross, you know, They're like the rats. The rats don't recognize borders, no? They recognize food. Uh, so I think what's happening now, especially in the area, uh, area of international politics, is to think about threats to the state or threats to the regional order that are, that do not, you know, that are not necessarily the soldiers or thieves and all that, but also these things. Uh, as to what happens when people call each other vermin, uh, they probably will shoot each other because in Gerald Santo City, for example, they ban singing of my way. Nah? <laughs> because, you've heard of this, no? Huh? Yeah. They ban the singing of my way because, uh, that's not vermin, well, isn't it? Well, huh? uh, they ban the singing of my way because if you sing it badly, you're an insult to Frank Sinatra, so you deserve to be shot. <laughs> but if you sing it so well, okay, you are much better than Frank Sinatra. You are a threat to Frank Sinatra, so you have to be shot. <laughs> so, uh, so that kind of very uh, related. Uh, my main takeaway from your lecture is that this is a story of state increasingly becoming centralized and powerful with the aid of science. So could you sort of speak to that some more in terms of, and perhaps for ground, you know, anticipating your next study on mosquitoes, would it still be sort of the same story? That increasingly the central authority is becoming more powerful with the aid of science. Yeah, well, the, 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 the first thing that really got me interested in this was growing up in Northern Mindanao. You know, rats are hit, people deal with rats, beauty contest, blah, blah, blah. And then going to Los Banos and asking the librarian at the Institute of Rice Research Institute of any studies on rats. And what you find out, what I found out, is a very bland scientific reportage of how many rats were killed. You know, it's very economistic discussion of you know, uh, how many rats are killed in you know, a certain period of time, X, Y, Z. It's very economics. So when I sat down with the guy, one of the guys there, I said, you know, how many rats did you really kill? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out the, the distinction. What, what accounts for the disappearance of these creative, very wonderful stories at the local level? <clears throat> and now the display, its displacement by a really bland technocratic description of a malady, a pestilence, that continues to hound us. Uh, two years ago, I think they killed 25 million rats in Vivesia. But we don't know about that anymore. And one of the reasons I think was, the remark was, was <coughs> to contain the panic, you have to centralize. And to contain the panic, you also have to change the way it's talked about. Okay. It's not the bubonic plague anymore. It's an economic problem, statistical problem. So that's what I noticed as I looked at the, uh, the reports of the Rodent Research Center starting in the Marcos period. And some of the studies by scientists, entomologists, biologists, on rats uh, that were published in Los Banos and later on in Australia. It's a wonderful compilation of things. It's very boring, like a way. Uh, and then you say, no, wait, where's the beauty? You know, why is it that economics doesn't factor in the rat adobo? So that's the reason why I was uh, curious about, fascinated with that. But as states centralize, and take control of certain campaigns away from communities and provinces, one of the things that disappear is life. States suck the life out of people. I hope that's it. I answer you. Hello, my name is Elia Pili. I'm from uh, Political Science Department, and I'm also from Kazakhstan. I'm a PhD student in uh, Political Science Department. Actually, my research, my PhD dissertation, very similar to your topic. And um, I find it's very hot now in the, in the world because it's the exercise of biopower, so it's not it's just easy topic. In fact, it's a very heavy topic because of the exercise of biopower of state over a periphery particular or the population that actually don't understand what's happening to them when the state exercises that. And, 
Um, and coming from Central Asia, actually the problem of rodents and rats were taken incredibly seriously by the Soviet state in 1950s, 60s, at the same time when uh, often sanitary epidemiological station had powers uh, higher than police, so they could come and just burn your house if they want to, you know? So, <laughs> so, and, and that issue till now, actually, because uh, recently you mentioned China, but also in Kyrgyzstan, little country in uh, Central Asia, they also had a case of uh, plague, and also the you know everyone expects sanitary epidemiological station to do their work to be you know to be very uh, powerful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my question is uh, that's very interesting. And you said that there, it went uh, in hand with the uh, rice production increase in the Philippines, and, and it means it went at the same period where there was a green revolution. You mentioned yeah. Rockefeller Foundation, yeah. and Rockefeller Foundation introduced basically <laughs> green. Green Revolution, yeah, and yeah. they introduced also the, yeah. the the program against the rats, yeah. which is part of the epidemiological biopolitics. Basically. Yeah, you're right. Uh, that's the effect. That's why it's an ongoing research because I have still to get data on the Green Revolution mm -hmm. and their relationship to rodent infestation. But if you go to Institute of Rice, uh, the International Rice Research Institute and look at their paddies, yeah. what different kinds of rice varieties are there? One of the things that's very noticeable is they also experimenting on how to protect these new rice varieties from rats. So it's very fascinating, actually. It's not it, you, you, if you just uh, look at the rice varieties and say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's a good one, blah, blah, blah. but look at the size. That's it. Um, the problem with that, I think, is uh, I, know, I can't find the data yet. Uh, uh, most likely, <coughs> the Green Revolution started in Latin America. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. Mexico, actually. But yeah. then uh, in Asia, it first started in the Philippines and then right. the Philippines. And then what happened was... Mexico was yeah. wheat. Oh, rice, yeah, Mexico was wheat. Yeah, India was wheat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. India was wheat. Yeah. 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 No, it's in the 90, early 1960s, actually. 1960s, yeah. 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 And, but the research started by Rockefeller Foundation in uh, Latin America in 1930s, 40s, 50s. They started with, first with the medicine and the antibiotics and then moved to the food right, in 1950s. Right, right. So, and I'm looking at it as a Cold War perspective because I'm looking at what Soviets did at the same time in Central Asia and what Americans did in the Philippines. That's why it's, it's interesting yeah, to see the dynamics. Yeah. How you should really check that website because you know it's all very boring statistical study. Study of village X, how many people were bitten by mosquitoes. No, it's really yeah. this one. And occasionally, if you look at the patterns, and you notice Americans are really worried about the bubonic plague. You know? And they're worried now because if you look, if we Google bubonic plague in the United States, it's actually rising alongside dengue. Okay. Dengue, which started here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in Kazakhstan, the eat rats. Uh, no, absolutely not. Oh. Only horses. What do you eat? <laughs> 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 uh, before you go, can you tell us about the Before you came, you wrote me an email message, right? Uh, asking whether you can be allowed to write about the women's movements and movement in the Philippines. I hope you will not connect the women's movement to rats and mosquitoes. It's all male. <laughs> it's all male. The food I get grabbed is always male. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, I have two uh, reflections and questions about it. As an anthropologist, not as a feminist researcher, uh, I, I was I was reflecting on on where if if uh, the rap culture has been with us for a long time, it should be it should be embedded in our folk tradition, in our jokes, and in all the folk narratives. But I don't remember it being in any even uh, even in archaeology. If you look at archaeological data, so maybe talagang modern phenomenon siya. It's associated with wet, wet rice agriculture, and of course, uh, scientific technologies no, that were introduced. Uh, my my question is more pragmatic because we have graduate students here. How was the collection of data for social history, and primarily using you know? non-published documents. Our students will benefit from this. Uh, I, I was for four years in Mindanao for a project, and I saw how documents coming from schools and government institutions are just in the bodega. And I, op um, I went to one province, and I saw all the documents, na maraming rat data ng, ng 
ng health no na nakatapon na sa bodega nila maybe you can just share with us how you went about collecting and what are the challenges uh, you went to our national archives you went to all our that uh, so maybe you can that would be very useful for us okay. So first, the uh, Tuli Gerda Thomas men, a second... Imelda? Imelda wasn't a rat? No, she was never called a rat. No. She was called Miss Piggy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wala tayong mga jokes in Shadow. Yeah. Well, uh, the one, one thing that's really it about why there, is, there are no jokes is that these newspapers, even the local ones, wrote in English. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out what the, lo the local design, for example, newspapers wrote. And the problem is that in a paper, humid, tropical country, they start to decay. So you're running against time for graduate students. The way I was able to do that is first to figure out where are the best use clippings in the Philippines. And it's not in the UP library, it's in the Lopez Museum. Lopez Museum, Lopez Museum cuts clippings from the Manila Times, the Daily Mirror, up to 1972 at least, by topic. So that's where I found that. The second one is to establish the pattern for what's it happening. So the statistics I found there, you know, gave me an idea as to which provinces you should focus on. So when I went to some of these provinces, Cotabato, for example, the first thing to do is to look for the local newspaper. And of course, the answer is, hey, pinakilo na namin. So then the next stop then is to look for the old man, the old woman, the old folks. And you know, over to back, <laughs> patiently you know, talking to them about their stories as kids growing up. Because the problem with us, actually, with those of you who are historians, is once you get out of Manila, the basis of information is oral. Okay? Nobody sits down in Waola no Delsor to write his or her diary, their diary. Today, I sold five rats. No. <laughs> but everybody knows who sells rats. If you go to Lano del Sur, for example, you know who, for example, you can rely on to change the car plates of the car nap, you know, the car car nap in Manila. You know. And that's local knowledge. And I think, in a certain way, it will take a long time. Because in the, on the one hand, you're an outsider, though. No? So you're always viewed by the people as somebody who will spy on them. So one of the things that prevented me from writing about Mindanao fully was my own province. When I talked to, when I went to, to Osamis and said to the mayor, hey, I want to look at the history of Osamis City, uh, it was still the height of Kuratong Balili. Yeah, and uh, Vietnamese rice were being smuggled in, into the bay. And of course, like any mafia, they say, why talk about us, you know? Talk about somebody else, you know? <laughs> so those are the things that you, you have to figure out. And this, therefore, it teach a lot of immersion. No? And the third thing is learning the language. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one problem we have in terms of field research is we, don't, we only speak one or two languages. As I mentioned in one form, I think, here, uh, if you talk to smugglers in Sulu, they can speak eight languages. Mabuti uh, nalo can speak Tauso, Magindanao, Maranao, Galo, Bisayan, Bahasa, English, Hokkien, Chabacano. So, you know, it, I think what we could do at the university is adapt that kind of philosophy, teach our kids to learn more and one or more languages. Because outside, the ordinary folks, are really learning it. And if you don't have access to that, it's easy, they could shift, no? Uh, Matthew, for example, wouldn't want me to, and Ed wouldn't want me to understand what they're talking, which is Shabakano. And you're like, uh, you know. Uh, so I think uh, that's one way. I'm too old for languages, but I think for the young people, it's really important to not just learn Tagalog or English or, or Visaya, but the local language. And then the local idiom back, no? Star meat. Uh, so it's fun, it's fun doing this in the field. You're a good lesson in communication, Jojo. Huh? I mean, any topic under the sun can be made interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, the other interesting thing... I wasn't interested in the red particularly, because I know you, Jojo. I've known Jojo quite a while. 
I know that he always takes things off tangent, out of left field. And uh, as, as a starter, I think you get into something in the middle that's really interesting and important, just like now. But um, uh, just to follow that other, that other lady's comment, um, two things, Jojo. First, um, if you can elaborate a little bit more on how you got started in rats, or all that looks like <laughs> some, you know, how it in the your mind. And second, I pity the rats from a culture standpoint. I mean, the rats are <laughs> like rats. <laughs> and they just try to survive <laughs> in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, world messed up by humans, you know. Yes. Growing up, we in the towns would kill rats the moment that we see them. In the villages, you know, they didn't bother. They didn't eat them particularly. They would from time to time. They would only touch them or try to kill them when they become they become a threat to the farm. Yeah. In the mountains, they ate them just like any other yeah. uh, edible uh, uh, mammal. Yeah. So uh, these things. Uh, if you could kindly give us a sense of cultural <laughs> attitudes about the rat. I think mean, that's important, uh, and you might want to shift to the two-legged kind too, if you like. Uh, two-legged next chapter. <laughs> uh, I got interested in this couple of things. One was uh, the debate. And, you know, sublime politicians, senior gentlemen, you know, talking about us. I was doing this when I was doing my, uh, I found out this out when I was doing my field research. In the library in the House of Representatives for my dissertation. So how does one explain this? And then I can figure out, aha, that's why when you go to Cebu, you don't eat your pau. Because, uh, Fidel, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Fidel can contradict me with this. Uh, but uh, because of that. So it's all a combination of everyday knowledge and reading something. And that wonderful book I mentioned about this journalist who spent two years watching rats in one alley in uh, New York City, you know, observing them. You know. So they're very intelligent, smart people. Uh, and then, of course, uh, what happened in Mindanao, okay? Well, uh, well, got interested in Ilagas in Mindanao because nothing has still, this is 2014, with the exception of Maritus Vito and Glenda Gloria, nothing has been written on the war in Mindanao from a social historian's perspective. So you have leaders like Meswari, Ramos, blah, 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 all these big guys talking about the war, but you never get a chance, and the people who never get a chance to tell that story are the Ilagas, the privates, the MNF guerrillas. So that's when, that's one of the things that got me interested about the Ilagas. And I discovered yeah, these Ilagas, no? And of course, you know, uh, uh, rats meat with coconut milk to die for. Ah, sorry. Attitudes about the rat all over the second. What about Cultural attitudes about the rat. The second I don't know. You, you, you organize hate it, right? No, no, no. My second. Ah, what is it? My second query was about the attitudes of the rat itself. You know, I was telling you in my hometown, in the town. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the villages, you could eat them. When they become dangerous, you yeah. kill them. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, well, two things that are happening in the now. There's some sort of unsated agreement between the rats. I don't know because they're intelligent and humans that you don't invite, you don't shake the environment, you don't kill them, or they'll kill you. And the, the peasants always talk about that. The king rat. Don't do this, or else the king rat will come down and kill all our children. Which part of? Uh, in Mitsaya. Yes, Sayam. Yeah. I'm from Sayam. I'm from Sayam, no? Yeah, they always tell that, you know, hey, don't bother the gun, because, you know, magagalit yung alaga, eh, alaga, eh. So there is a sense of respect towards the rat, that it will respect you and, 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 and as well be respected. The other thing I'm really curious about is the king rat. Who the heck is this king rat? <laughs> you know? And it's something shared by all Southeast Asian societies, in Burma, in Thailand, in Indonesia, there's always this notion of the king rat. What is she or him? Is she, no? Uh, and, yeah. And that means respect also for the hierarchy. It's a very hierarchical creature, you know? So what kind of hierarchy operates there? Uh, that was what, you know, the, the cultural thing. <coughs> uh, the third reason I got interested in, it's very off-tangent, really, hero, <coughs> smell, no? Uh, the fourth chapter is I want to write a history of Amoy. 
Because Filipinos do this, you know. Bakit hindi mo kinausap? Eh, baho-baho eh. We don't, we're not facial, eh. Uh, but it was also from that that I did, so what, what do rats, how do rats smell? Yeah, especially, they're very, they're very particular actually about food. They don't eat raw food. They're very choosy like us. Yeah, no, they're very choosy. Uh, the rats. Oh. Yeah, that's how we go. That's how we prefer. Ch yeah, New York has Chinese food. Like, <laughs> they actually, they're very, it's a very intelligent species. And how does it keep itself quote unquote clean? No? And the final one is, of course, the fleas and the lice. No? Sensors, wonderful work. When I started reading it, I just fell in love with it. So that's it. That's, uh, of course, in your moment. Yeah, I'm from Hawaii. Huh? From from Hawaii, I'm from the boring camp, economics camp. My so, babysitter. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I babysit for Angela. Yeah. Sometimes. This guy. So yeah, you brought out a very important point between the interplay between local programs and central programs. You said that because of central programs, the local knowledge has relatively disappeared. But yeah. I think it should be a balance between both, because in the local pro uh, local programs, you have some sort of a limited scope in like dealing with the rat problem. The second is that there's tons of perverse incentives. For example, I heard a story that with this contest, the rat tails contest, some people took to breed rats so that, you know, as they grow, they can have more. Uh, smuggled yeah. So the other thing is that, well, the national programs have the advantage of scale, right? They have, can deploy all the resources that they have. But the problem is that uh, it's something inherent in agriculture. It's it's so hard to monitor like progress. So if a program fails, you don't know whether it's from the Ilaga or I mean from the Daga or from the Bagil, right? And you can see that until now, most of the programs in agriculture are the like the milking cows of politicians right now because of you know it's it's hard to uh, to know what's really happening. So I guess for your book. It's nice to know, although you know, I know that you abhor like boring statistics, but you have to present like how effective are these programs, both the local and the national government, like in relation to say the whole uh, budget of agriculture, for example, how much is, yeah, how much is devoted to rats, for example. That would be interesting. And how it affected rice productivity, because her comment is correct that it came at the precisely the same time that the Green Revolution right. uh, happened. So you don't know really if, you know, if not for the Green Revolution and with the pagkalat ng mga daga, siguro gutom na mga Pinoy noon, we couldn't yeah. export rice during that time. So that would be good. Yeah. And lastly, I hope in our future Inuman sessions, you could uh, maganda kayo ng rats. <laughs> uh, the first thing, Carl, is that, the, again, going back to Boyd's point about states, when states produce reports, they're really very bland reports. What first disappears are the local reports that come out. Look at annual reports of different departments. Right? I mean, you know, this Susona, for example. Uh, but the, what disappears are the local, the, the, the real materials that are there. They got put in the archives or sent for recycling. No? Uh, any government, any state does that. So they have that problem. The second problem is the inefficiency of the state. One of the things that I'm having a hard time dealing is connecting leptospirosis, the history of leptospirosis, from 1946 to now. Because the, the NCSO, just in terms of diseases, just lists for a while flu. But flu is, can be caused by what? Thousands, hundreds of people. Uh, and then, Mindanao pa. No? Uh, <laughs> you go to the Muslim areas, and the war zones, and say, uh, okay, how many of you died of leptospirosis? You just manufacture the data, no? So, so that's the third thing, the inefficiency of the collection. Third, actually, we don't know. Even in New York, they don't know how many rats have been killed. How many rats can be found in the sewers? of the major cities. And that's what's wonderful about rats, no? Uh, they're all over the place. And every effort by state, community, law, military, contain them has been uh, negated. Uh, I will not be able to answer your question, but I'm trying to find as much statistics as I can. Ang problema lang is, in today's reportage on rats, it's nation, national na. 
the local statistics have disappeared most of the time. Huh? Wala eh, national statistics. Ayan ang problema ko eh. There's a problem with tracking uh, the, the statistics on rats killed after 64 when the Rodent Research Center and the Germans actually took over the campaign. National na. So you don't know which provinces get hit. Yeah? And you don't know which provinces get hit now with rats, di ba? Despite the Green Revolution. Hi, my name is Esther. I'm an instructor with the College of St. Pinion. But I also have a taking my master's here. Isaya, professor. Right. So um, you mentioned Durano and the conversation with Alonto. No? I grew up also in Mindanao State University campus. Which one? Maine, Marawi, City, ah. Iligan, Cagayan de Oro Corridor. So the whole Mindanao put ko. When I was growing up in Mindanao and Chavacano, Sanguanga, see you. So <laughs> we can talk and then you'll be left out. But in Marawi, when I was living on campus, um, I have so many wonderful Maranao friends. Dogs were really a huge source of disgust, more than rats. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I don't know if you found this out in your, I don't know, mga narratives, stories, but the extermination would be for the dogs and not the rats. And yeah, we yeah. had a personal experience of our dog, our family dog, no nakalabas lang, it just got out of the fence one day and it was like killed with an, a BB pellet gun because they hate dogs for religious purposes. But this is, my context is Marawi City, I'm not speaking for other Um, Muslim ethnic groups in Mindanao, but dogs really, if you had the dog, you had to either keep your dog inside the house on a tight leash, but even if it was just, I don't know, in parang, um, if anyone could see it from the outside, it's a target for extermination, either by a slingshot, a BB pellet gun, or anything else. So we had like a slew of dead dogs, like pet dogs, being killed in MSU campus, because they were seen as rodents, as something to be exterminated. So I don't know, I'm curious if maybe you came across stories of the dog. Being killed for Yes, killed. and not the rat. Oh, okay. well, if you go to Elegant City and Osami City, the dogs are being killed because of the meat. Papaitan, uh Calgareta. -huh. So actually in the 70s, well, I don't try to track it down, but there's a, decline, a massive decline of stray dogs in northern Mindanao around the 80s. Um, uh, have you eaten dogs? No. Yes. Oh, my. The <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a long stew. You stew it for two days, three days. And the dogs will, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's a good question. I don't know why uh, dogs are being killed as pests in Marawi, while in Kiligan, which is what, two hours now? One. Um, one hour? Uh, it's uh, being killed to, for food. And then in Cebu, a possible alternative to rat's meat. Oh, 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 there are also other things that's been disappearing in our cats. We go around the whole city, they all say meow meow. You want to eat from meow meow? Oh, I hear that. Yeah. That's how creative our people are. See, the organizer, the organizer, the Mamunlo. Mamunlo, there you go. <laughs> Next time we'll have it catered. I'll be a model. Hello, sir. Ah, how are you? I'm over. Matthew is one of my students. Yes, now that, I, now, now that our class is over, I'm an instructor from UP Baguio. Huh? So, ah. this question is actually like a follow up from Ma'am on the historical aspect of the archival documents and another one about the king rat because I can't get over it. Now the first question is, I was just curious as to how far have you have you researched on the relation between the rats and page social Philippine social history? Particularly are there any other political relations as early as the Spanish period? Have there been any problems with rat plague, rat infestation during those times? Or have you done at least some Uh, some excavations of the archives on that. Now, the second question is about the King Rat. You, it, it, has, it has been frequently mentioned, has been frequently mentioned in this forum that if you attack the rats, the King Rat, or the, they will now retaliate with 
quid pro quo. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious, in the course of your research, have you encountered a narrative or any doc or any maybe tabulation story that the there was really an attack directly, not by your like not by disease, not by not by mites, uh, an, a, 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 an attack, an attempt. Direct, on, direct, yeah. Yes, by the rats to human beings. Like, yeah, it's always a threat that they are bogey. Yeah. A bogey, it's a bogey. Yeah. Bogey, 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 bogey. Uh, and the second one, I think if you look, at, it's very closely related to the way uh, medicine, health, the health history of the Philippines developed. And I think it's more mainly American. Okay? Because uh, the Spaniards were lazy, you know? 250 years, nothing was happening. Uh, you know, they were all not lazy, they were a little bit stupid. Uh, so, priest. So, uh, so, the Americans were really the first ones to bother it. And what's this fascinating thing about states? Most of us are fascinated with guns, campaigns. You know? But I think one of the most powerful sources of the state is health. Because how, it's not how you keep your community, uh, it's, it's both to keep your community clean, but also to monitor diseases, you know, which can threaten the state itself. So the Americans, for example, this, this Air Forces Monitoring Board, uh, Management Board, was, you know, fascinating. The U.S. Army is the one that is first on the lead. It doesn't kill people, it studies rats. It doesn't not only kill people, it studies rats, the military. And, that, and it's very much related to that. So I think under American rule, you can see the first documentary statistics of one of the things that you'll always find in the Department of Health report in the 1912-1913 is how many rats were killed in Metro Man in the Manila Pier. They keep counting that to show that the plague has been stopped on the fort. And there were no report, were less terminals reports yet on the countryside because the roads were not yet built. So you, you can't send statisticians there yet. And in the case of Mindanao, it was really rainforest. It was rainforest until 1946. There were no roads. Uh, it took me, what, two days to travel from my hometown to Grande Oro. Now it's four hours. And that was it. Uh, so as the, the richest of the state through roads spread, the statistics also came, started to come in. Okay. Um, and that's when the first statistics were simple. Tell us, it's statistician counter an anomaly. It gets added. So a study is a social history of statistics. Actually, is one thing that's worth exploring. Too. Hello, my name is Jessica Yotze. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. <laughs> it was my first lecture here. I am a doctoral student from Germany, Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies, and I'm visiting the Asian Center for three months. So um, I'm really looking forward to the next lectures now. Um, my question is, I'm interested in the sociology of um, evaluation and um, uh, standardization. So listening to your uh, storyline of different measures against rats, I was wondering if it's not in numbers, uh, what is success of a measure? And how is a certain measure legitimized? in, uh, let's say, in, in, in the uh, social environment. So I would think that the technocratic approach has quite different ways uh, to argue for success than, let's say, the beauty contest. Yeah. Uh, so I think there would also be a story there. Yeah, I mean, that was what, one of the things that fascinated me. At the local level, there was no talk of success. It just happens. Okay. And you have to deal with it with what resources you have. So in Batanes, they issued a law, a law, local law, uh, requiring everybody to kill, you know, bring them a rat tail or be penalized by peso. Um, um, so, but it's, as you go up, local to national, each state, because it's, it's concerned with its you know, uh, legitimacy, it has to show success. Yeah, Zona, the Zona, what's the Zona? It's not, it's not, there's no president that says, I'm sorry, I failed. <laughs> Each state always, as it goes up, always makes, uh, well, only Clinton, no? It depends on what sex, sex, 
the Clinton, Clinton even didn't uh, apologize. But as you go up, and there's always the aim to show success. And therefore, the numbers become very interesting. Uh, it's not so much the local numbers, but the national. So you have to get 20 million rats killed, yes. But you know, rats produce thousands. So I think what's happening is uh, this contrast, this contrast and uh, conflict within how locals perceive fighting the rats. Remember, in the community, you don't fight rats to kill them. You fight, you fight them to restore the balance of coexistence. That's how people think of it. Okay. And so, but on top, it's total elimination. And in the middle, you have the rano. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think I, um, um, that probably is, I mean, it's actually wrong to start with the question of failure and success. Because that's state driven. Local communities have a different sense of that. If they don't talk success or win, they say, let's go back to where we were. No? All right, we have time for one more question. We are at Smith, no? After? Maybe yeah. Linda. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Sorry, one last sorry. question. Any? Any takers? Uh, if there are no takers, may I call on Dean Eduardo Gonzalez to give our closing remarks. And let's give um, our speaker. <laughs>